Chase Thomas podcast. The Chase Thomas podcast. <laughs> um, my nephew needs me to record. See, I hate. I already hate it. I hate it. All right, hello, and welcome back to another episode of the Chase Thomas podcast, where I'm still at the A for mentioned Chase Thomas coming to you live from Knoxville, Tennessee. Everything School HQ over there in. Oof. Who knows? He's he's up there in the attic. He's doing work till who knows when. It's my favorite co night owl. Uh, covering the volunteers of BallQuest.com. Brent Hubs. Brent, good evening, sir. How are you? I'm doing great, Chase. Hope you're doing well, my friend. Hope you're enjoying the warm sunshine. Hopefully it'll stay this way for a little while. We, I, I, we're we kindred spirits in that we have no use for cold weather. So no. God bless spring. God bless long days. And uh, here, here's what here's, here's to hopefully a, a busy spring of, you know, a, a lot of intrigue on the football side of things a baseball team that's in the top five and mm. maybe a basketball team that can actually make a, a long run here in the postseason so it, it's a crazy time right now it's a lot of fun yeah i'm gonna have to have the talk with my wife of like i guess i'll see you next week because <laughs> of what the basketball baseball schedule is this weekend and over the potential next week or two um there's a lot going on here uh with tennessee baseball and basketball and in spring practice next week i mean this is uh you're not going to find a more hectic this is like one of the uh, it's a, a good problem to have, I guess, is to be this good at everything right now, is that everything is must-see. Tennessee baseball against Alabama is must-see. Tennessee SEC tournament is must-see. Um, spring practice, glimpses of Nico, that's all must-see. Like, it's just, there's a lot of a lot of good Tennessee content uh, to cover and, and watch right now. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. And, um, you know, it's it, it's why they're the everything school, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, it's just, there, there's a lot of good things happening on campus and, I think you go back to the leadership that that starts with Randy Boyd and Dondi Plowman. That's put Tennessee in in a, in a you know a very good spot. Um, you know they've got good coaches. They've got stability. Uh, I think they've got the bulk of the NCAA stuff behind them, uh, if not all of it behind them at this point. And um, it's full steam ahead. You know on all fronts, but but in particular football on Monday when they hit the practice field, and then where Rick Barnes and and his team is now that they move into the second phase of the season, which is you know, the, the dreaded one and done phase. If you have a bad day, it's, it's all over type deal. So um, it's a different mindset there. And then baseball is just in a marathon. I mean, they're mm. just, they're in like mile three of the 26 marathon, 26 mile marathon right now. And uh, it's been a nice, it's been a little nice downhill run for them. You know, when you look at their schedule, they've cruised and, and now it's, now there's some hills to climb as you get into the competitiveness of the SEC. I'm excited to pace around my house uh, every weekend once again because goodness gracious, the the cardiac balls like it's uh, every weekend. It's uh, it's gonna be it's gonna be intense and obviously with basketball too uh, with the tournament uh, both SEC and baseball. But I want to focus on football here, uh, Brent. With spring practice uh, coming uh, down the pike here next week, a um, lot lot I've been thinking about when it comes to Tennessee's 2024 roster. Obviously. The eight and a half over under goes up to nine and a half in the last month. There's more and more belief, more buy-in uh, in Tennessee fourth best SEC title odds of 16, which is huge. Like coming into the year, like that's it. You, you're like, oh, fourth place. It's like well in a divisionalist SEC with Texas and Oklahoma jumping into the fray. There's a lot of excitement and a lot of buy-in in what uh, year four could look like here uh, under Josh Heupel in Knoxville. But my first question to you, what is your number one spring practice question uh, that you've been thinking the most about with Tennessee football right now? Uh, you know, I think it's, you know, big picture wise, it's probably just how deep is this team? How, how much mm-hmm. when you leave spring practice, how many guys do you think, man, that guy could really help us? He can help us yeah. this fall. Um, that proverbial above the line and below the line, if you will, you, you know, you look at a guy and say, well, he's probably a year plus away. Or you look at this guy and go, hey, he's he's definitely ready to go. I mm-hmm. don't think that you're going to come out of spring and have a left tackle established. I don't think you're going to come out and have your, your your five secondary guys as you're replacing all your starters from a year ago. I don't think you're going to come out and go, okay, these are our five. We're done. Yeah. You know, I think it's more about how many in the back end do I feel like I, that that we can win with right now. Is Mm -hmm. that five? Is that eight? Is that 10, 12? You know, same thing for the offensive line. You know, is it, is it four guys searching for a fifth and then I don't know, or do you come out of spring practice and go, Hey, you know what? We got seven or eight guys. We think we can line up and play with Mm -hmm. if called upon that they can go, you know, play and, and win play winning football for us. 
You know, so so for me, it's about how deep is this team at different positions. Look, the wide receiver spot looks really deep right now, right? Are those skill are those new skill guys going to live up to that hype? You know, if you say so, then they're going to be a that's going to be a really deep squad. You know, tight end wise, lot to prove there. So th- there's a lot of questions. I think big picture, the biggest question is of your 85 scholarship guys. You know, um, and let's throw in a few walk-ons. Let's say 90 guys. Of your nine, I mean, of your ninety guys that 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 could are talented enough to play, how many of them do you believe it can line up and win for you, right now? You know, and what does that number look like at the end of spring compared to the start of spring? Is that a is that a greater number? It, it, you know, are you a deep team? Are you a team that you go, we can't get mm-hmm. an injury here, or this guy's gonna have a great summer here to have a chance to help us? Th- those are the big things for me. I think that's interesting way of looking at it. It's like, I think so many fans probably glob on to, okay, who's going to be the starter? Who's going to be the difference maker? But what you're suggesting, and I think that's a really astute point of it, like, it's actually about who is not going to be a factor is like who we got like come summer and fall, they're just too far gone or it's going to take some time. Like it could be freshmen. It could be guys who you hoped were going to be able to make a jump uh, from year two to year three, things like that, where you're like, they're not going to be, rotation guys it looks like so you just know you so you can plan better for the summer and fall and just kind of know because not everybody's going to be ready not everybody's going to be ready to contribute and um spring ball actually being on the inverse of what folks might expect i think uh, is a big one and then i think part two is i am very curious how they handle tight end spring and summer because when you talk about a position group that can't suffer any major injuries going into this year they've been very fortunate tennessee has um, even with the numbers from the first year with Hypo and the last couple, like they're, they haven't really had to deal with some devastating injuries to any particular room outside of maybe you could say linebacker last year. Um, that one was hit pretty hard, uh, right. by the end of the year, but by and large, Tennessee's had some really nice injury luck, uh, the last three years that, that room this year in particular cannot suffer any major injuries to one of Holden stays and Ethan Davis and Ethan Davis has been banged up before he got injured literally in the spring game last year uh, with a big time catch from Nico. So I am most curious in terms of position groups from this spring. My question is how involved and how hard do they push Holden and Ethan? Because you just, you have to have them both a hundred percent come first week of uh, September. Yeah. The, the, the challenge for that position though, is, is those are not returning veterans that you yep. can put them in bubble wrap and put them on the shelf. Right. You not know, a hey, Cooper Mays situation. Yeah, right. It's not Cooper Mays and it's not James Pierce. Right. Mm-hmm. It's not these guys who, Hey, I know what that guy can do. I don't really want to hear about them. Mm-hmm. And instead, these are guys that the whole of the States was coming from, you know, a Notre Dame offense that bled the clock, you know, that was pretty methodical into this offense. And we heard McCall and Castles a year ago talk about just how difficult the transition it was, you know, just learning the Tennessee offense and, and mm-hmm. how it can overwhelm you if you're not careful. He credited Jacob Warren for helping him into that. But but Holden State's has got to figure this offense out. You can't do that by standing and watching. You can't do it by just going through walkthroughs. You, you've got to be in the fray. And, and Ethan Davis is a guy who's got to be more physical, right? He's got to be mm-hmm. a more physical blocker. You don't do that by standing and watching. But to your point, you, you can't afford to get one of them hurt in spring practice, but you can't afford not to practice them either, you know, and, and that's the that's the challenge um, of that position. So you, you just got to go get those guys ready, and, and you hope if they get banged up, it's, it's something minimal that they can bounce back from you know, really quickly after spring practice. And you just hope that there's no significant injury and um, knock on wood, you just don't have anything like that happen, but you just can't take a chance and saying, Hey, we're going to limit all your contact until the, until week one, because we don't have any other options at the tight end position. When, when in reality, those guys need as much work as anybody on this roster does. I it just there's all kinds of intrigue there and I can't wait to see what it looks like. And like you said, they, they're going to have to learn and they're going to have to play and you're just going to have to hope that they're able to stay healthy uh, this year uh, because they're just so critical to what Tennessee does. And you've you've talked about for years just how important the tight end position is in this offense. So Holden and Ethan making the leap and being healthy and being available is going to be critical this spring and summer. Um, what position battle are you most locked in on uh, this spring? I think probably safety, um, hmm. but for one, a, a, you're replacing two veteran guys. Okay, I mean Jalen McCullough played 
487,000 snaps in his time at Tennessee. I mean, he, he had more starts than anybody in school history and just played, you know, just all the time. Mm -hmm. um, he's gone. Um, Wesley Walker's gone. So you, you got two new safeties coming in there. And who are those guys? Yeah. You know, Jacoby Thomas is the transfer from Middle Tennessee State. I mean, he, he made the wise choice in picking Tennessee because, you know, looks like an opportunity to step right in and play right away mm -hmm. and, and be the guy. Um, where, where is Slaughter, you know, in, in this, John Slaughter, where's he at in, in this competition? Uh, Andre Turrentine got the, he started the last three games, I guess, for Tennessee, um, made a big play in the Iowa game with an interception in the mm -hmm. red zone, um, which was a big play at the time. Cause Iowa had some momentum. Um, yeah. Not, it's not like he picked off Patrick Mahomes, but I mean, he made a good play. I and mean, they were red. driving, like, who knows that the momentum yeah. could have, like, that was right. a momentum I mean, changing a play. play. Mm -hmm. and, and so that should give him some confidence. So, where does he factor in there? Is Will Brooks, is he going to be, what, what's his competition level to safety spot? So, so you got three or four guys there in the competition, but man, they're just green. They just don't yeah. have a ton of experience. And, and who, who takes a step? Right. How many of those guys take a step? Who 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 really steps out and kind of takes the bull by the horns, if you will, at that position over 15 practices? I, I think is going to be really intriguing to watch for me. Because I think they want to leave Jordan Thomas at star position. Mm -hmm. uh, because as, as exciting as Boo Carter is, I'm not sure Boo Carter is going to be ready to be the star, yeah. you know, right away. Uh that position requires a lot mentally. Um, they put a lot on that position in terms of adjustments, lining guys up and all those things. So I don't know that he can come in and win that job right mm -hmm. away because I'm not sure he's, where he's going to be mentally. Jordan Thomas is a guy you're talking about staying healthy. He's made plays, but he's also, you know, been in street clothes too many times, too. I mean, yeah. can he stay healthy? But, but I think safety jumps out to me as really an intriguing battle in terms of who's going to be starters there. Yeah, I mean, I don't think anything's set in stone there. Um, I think it's a nice competition between transfers and young guys who are waiting for their opportunity. The whole iron sharpens iron uh, strategy is going to be really interesting uh, there. And it's also like, to your point about just the amount of snaps that they're replacing at the two safety spots. I'm curious if Tim Banks holds true to just those kind of reps where it's like whoever he settles on this spring and summer as his two guys in the safeties or and also we can throw star in there does he still not really rotate and he just trusts those guys to be um to play the same uh, amount of snaps that mccullough was playing um for the last few years or is he more likely to rotate because these are new guys and he's still gonna let he, he's not 100 percent on anybody yet I'm, I'm curious if he rotates a lot more in the back end than he did the last few years yeah i'm, I'm with you i mean I, and i think that Part of the reason why he didn't rotate a year ago was that he was just so comfortable and had so much trust that McCullough was going to be where he was supposed to be. And he was going to, mm. he was going to correct mistakes. It's kind of like try to be the rim protector in basketball, if you mm. will, right? That, that he can mask somebody making a mistake. Does he really come out of spring or even fall camp going, all right, these two guys have shown me that, that I've got complete trust in them. Or is it going to be a little bit more by committee till somebody runs with the job? Yeah. It feels like there's a more opportunity for a rotation this this year than in previous years because it's hard for me to say that hard for me to think he's going to have that complete and 100 percent trust and just two guys over everybody else given their lack of experience that they have right now. No, I mean I 100 percent agree, and I I think that's a good problem to have. And this is one of those things where, look, I mean, they're replacing good players. Like Tamari McDonald was a really good player for Tennessee. Um, Wesley Walker was a huge find for Tennessee in the portal, and he was a great player for Tennessee. Um, McCullough, I think it, you could make the case, would you say last year was his best year as a Vol? Because I think you no could question. say that. Yeah. No question it was. So that's huge. So that's a lot of opportunity for these new guys to step in. But I'm with you. I think it's just going to be a rotation for a while and a learning curve a little bit. Um, I'm less... I don't I think it will be less that way, though, with the corners. Do you do you feel like it's just the corners is going to kind of we kind of know where they're going to go? I mean, obviously, with the transfer, you don't know what um, is it? Jermod McCoy is mm -hmm. that Jermod? Yep. Um, and then on the other side, obviously, Ricky Gibson, who got some starts and played a lot, obviously, in the Iowa game. So you feel pretty comfortable on both sides because McCoy obviously lit it up as a freshman in uh, at Oregon State. And 
uh, Ricky Gibson has all the intangibles in the world to be uh, a great corner for the next couple of years here in Knoxville. So you feel slightly, you don't feel good about the back end. It's just that you, I feel like you, you, you have a better understanding of what you have at the corner spot than at the safety spot right now. Right. Yeah. I mean, well, I mean, you've got two guys who you believe in, right. But those yeah. who've seen Ricky Gibson do it. And mm. there's obviously a, a year's worth of evidence of McCoy doing it in, in right. a league that throws the ball a lot, you know, with mm. last year. So, you know, that, that gives you some comfort. Now I think the question about that, that group and that position is what does your depth look like? Where's mm. Jordan Matthews? We all, we all have, you know, the high rankings, high ceiling, you know, with, with Jordan Matthews, but, but he's a guy who struggled last year. I mean, he really did. He, he struggled, you know, just with the transition from high school to the college game. Mm. And, and so where, where is he? I think this is an important spring for him, not from the standpoint of if, if he doesn't run and take off and, you know, just grow leaps and bounds and become a star this spring that he's suddenly a bust. But I do think this is a big spring for him to get his confidence back in himself and to create some belief with his coaching staff. Christian Conyers is a guy who played on special teams a great deal. Uh, where is he at in terms of being able to play corner? So I, I think you're right in that there's two guys that they feel pretty good about. The, the question is going to be, what does that look like behind them? And, and here's the thing we don't know, and, it, and this is the interesting part about spring practice, which goes back a little bit to what I was uh, talking about off the top. Mm. A year ago, Kamal had – Lots of many of us thought Kamal Haddon was going to go into the transfer portal last spring after spring practice. Mm -hmm. but that was just going to be kind of a hey, it's probably better off for you and us and everybody if we just we gave it a shot, it didn't work. This everybody just goes their separate ways and everything's good. Mm -hmm. And all Kamal Haddon did was went through spring practice and was Tennessee's best corner coming out of spring yeah. and ended up, you know, all right, we're not going we're not going to run him off. We want to make sure he stays you know, and do what we need to do. And and obviously he had a good year up until he got hurt. So um, sometimes those things happen in spring. Okay. And and, yeah. and not necessarily that, I guess you could say Kamal hadn't went and won a job last spring, but he went and won his place on the roster that they were like, we, we, you know, this, this guy's, he's above the line. He's absolutely going to help us and going to help us a lot to the point that we're going to be, there's too much value in him not being here. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I think, you know, that happens from time to time. And I, and I wonder where that is with a guy like, you know, Christian Conyer, a guy like Jordan Matthews. I mean, Christian Harrison's going to move to safety. That could be another guy that jumps up and, and is in the competition at the safety spot. We just don't yeah. know yet. Um, so those are some of the intriguing parts of spring practice is just, again, who factors in that you say, hey, this guy's going to be all right. You know, mm -hmm. and I think Jordan Matthews and Christian Conyers are two of those guys that Tennessee needs to say at the end of practice, hey, they're going to be all right. We're going to be all right there with those guys. They just need to keep coming this summer, but we're absolutely going to be ready to play them. Because if you go back and look, Willie Martinez played about four corners last year before Haddon got hurt. So he was rotating pretty good. Uh, who's he going to rotate with right now? I like their first two. I need to see three and four develop the spring. Absolutely. Um, who will be... The Brent Hubs guy from the 2024 class. I love Boo Carter. I mean, just the more I watched Boo Carter play this past fall, I mean, just, I just, he's so dynamic with the ball in his hands. He's such a good athlete. I, it's just, he's got, to, to me, he feels like he's got the it factor from mm. a competitive standpoint. Um, I, I'm just so intrigued. I'm in so intrigued by who he is and, and what he can do to help this team. And, and look, skill guys are easier to jump on, right? Mike Matthews. Yeah. I, mean, I, I, I love the, the Staley kid that they took from South Carolina. I, I think he's a really good player um, who, who's going to make an impact. i tell you some, some guy, a couple of guys that, that I'm really interested in seeing, not necessarily for this fall, but out of this class, is is a guy like Gage Ginther, the offensive hmm. lineman from Colorado. Yeah. Could he play center? Is that a guy that gets a look at center, or is he an, just a guard all the way? Uh, I think that's. So a you think tackles out for him potentially? Yeah, I mean, well, maybe. I mean, a right tackle. I guess you could you could do yeah. that. I just I'm curious to see where he factors in um, and what he looks like because I, I think that's a good. I think he's a good football player. Mm -hmm. I really do. I, I think that is one of those that it's going to be a good football player. I think Jesse Perry has a bunch of upside, but he's so raw. He doesn't know what he can or can't be just yet. 
you know, um, on the offensive line, which is intriguing. And of course, Bennett Warren's not here. Um, you know, the, the Ross kid from down in Alabama is not here yet. Those are two guys you'd love to see this spring, but I think those guys could, can step in and, and, you know, be, be interesting factors, you know, in 25 for sure. So, uh, th- those are some guys that I'm intrigued by. But the beautiful thing about this roster right now is, I mean, you need Boo Carter to be able to return, to be a return guy for you because you lost D. Williams. But you look at that 24 class, and you love Mike Matthews, and Mike Matthews yeah. should be a, somewhat of a factor, but Mike Matthews doesn't have to come in and be the guy right out of the gate. I mean, who mm-hmm. on that roster that, that they're coming in, and that's a credit to Josh Heupel and the staff and where they've got this roster at right now, that you're not giving out starting positions when you hand out uniforms. And, and Tennessee just went through too many years where guys were starters by default. Mm-hmm. Hey, Darnell Wright, you're the most talented guy. You're not ready. You're overweight. You're not sure, but you're the best guy we got. Figure it out. We're going to throw you out there at tackle. You figure it out against, you know, 21, 22-year-old men who have been playing college football for three years. Good luck. Yeah. Right. I mean, that's, I mean, Alante Taylor was a wide, re- wide receiver that they flipped to, to DB and said, Hey, not only are you playing DB, you're a starter. Mm. Congratulations. I know you haven't practiced yet, but you're a starter. And Tennessee's not in that world now, which I think is awesome. I mean, that, that's, that's why you're seeing Tennessee with the odds that you're seeing about them, because it's just not a situation, Chase, where they're just playing out of necessity half of their freshman class in critical roles like we've seen in years past. And it's a good problem to have. It's just that's where we are in the development, right? Like that's, that's, year that's exactly four in the what hype. you're looking for. I mean, listen, yeah. I, I think Peyton Lewis is, is at running back. has got a chance to be a really good player. Yeah, but I don't think Peyton Lewis has to be any kind of man or the guy. Of course, he, he'll miss spring practice because he's, you know, he's recovering from some injury stuff and surgery. But, you know, even a year ago, I mean, I like Cam Seldon. Mm. Cam Seldon got to sit back and be the fourth guy, you know, yeah. learn every day in practice. We'll get you some reps in when, you know, it's mop up duty time. And then of course you get to the bowl game and he gets some increased opportunities, but he had practiced for, you know, 16, 18 weeks to get ready for that point. That's mm. what you want to have happen. Now he's got to take a big step this spring, but, yeah. but, but you feel good about him because he's had a year to develop instead of going, Hey, you got to go, man. You got to play, yeah. you know, but it, it, you don't have any other options. We got to, you know, we have to play you. And, and and that's what, you know, you'd like to bring Peyton Lewis along a little bit slowly, particularly. You want Khalifa Keith to be a bigger factor. You want Absolutely. him to be, you, you know, want him to pop. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you just, you, you got some bodies there and, and you want, you know, you don't want to have to just put it all on a 17, 18 year old kid to say, Hey, you're mm-hmm. the guy. And, and that's, you know, Tennessee's not in a position where they have to do that with many guys in many positions, if any at all this spring or this fall. Yeah, I guess it's really the only person I would say maybe is Lance Hurd, where it's like you don't have a lot of start experience, but I mean, he has a year behind two elite offensive tackles to learn at LSU yeah, I mean, last year. You know, he's a little bit different because he's a transfer and he's been on the yeah. college campus. You know, I mean, he knows how to practice. He yeah. knows what it takes, you know, day in and day out. Um, There's just a lot of pressure campus. on him right out of the gate. Oh, yeah. Now, he's, you know, they brought him here to be the man, just like yeah. they did John Campbell a year ago. Mm-hmm. But 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 those guys understand that because that's the portal. The yeah. high school kids think they're going to be the man, but but they've always they they've lived in a world from the time they were seven eight years old where they have been the absolute best player on their team. Mm-hmm. Okay, I but, mean you got to watch some of these Jordan Ross high school tapes at Vesuvia right. Hills. You know, like I mean, the man. But, I mean, is... but but you know what? I mean, mm-hmm. some of those I, there's been a lot of guys who were man childs and you know elementary, middle, and high school, and it takes it takes a minute. Yeah. Right. I mean. Is James Pierce any better athletically now than he was when he arrived on campus? He's bigger and stronger, but in mm-hmm. terms of twitch and quickness off the ball, first step, all those things, he's probably not any much different than he was when he arrived. No. Okay? But when he arrived and he did those moves he did in high school, which was, hey, I'm going to outrun everybody off the edge, Darnell Wright caught him and you know threw him about five yards you know behind the play. Mm-hmm. And so. He had to learn, and these guys have to, you know, these guys who are elite high school players have to learn. That's where you have so much respect for a guy who comes in and plays as a freshman on the offensive line and is a good 
and is a good offensive lineman as a freshman, not just a guy surviving. I mean, I go back, you know, several years, but I mean, Aaron Sears was a guy who midway through his freshman year, like, okay, this guy's different. You know, obviously Jamal Lewis got off the bus and was like, okay, Travis saying, okay, these guys can play, you know, in mm-hmm. certain positions, it's easier to do that at. Um, but, you know, you, you got, there's just, there's a learning curve for these guys. And so, Again, you just don't want to put it all on those guys right out of the gate, and Tennessee's got the luxury they don't have to do that. Yeah. Um, I'm I'm excited to see ultimately what happens there, but I think it's a good problem to have for sure. Um, where is Tennessee, though, thinnest heading into 2024? Is it tight end or is it somewhere else? No, I think it's tight end. No. I think it's tight end. And, 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 and here's where I say it's tight end is because who, who who's the bodies behind t- the two? Like, is there a three? I mean, is it is there a walk on? Cole Harrison, does he play there? right? Like, I mean, Cole he... Harrison's, you know, I, I mean, that's putting a lot on him to to try to do that right at, you know, be that right out of the gate. So, uh, I, I would say when you look at bodies, just sheer bodies, thinnest would have to be the tight end position because a you don't have many bodies and you've got nobody proven at that position either. Has anyone moved? Like, or I guess I shouldn't say has anyone moved. Could anyone move to tight end in a pinch? Could like they do a just because they're a supreme athlete like Princeton Fant was just to do it all. It's hard to define what position Princeton Fant really was. I mean, he could do right. so many different things. Like, is there someone on the roster right now who could fit that mold that they could use the spring and summer to use as like that emergency Swiss Army knife guy? You know, I mean, sadly, if they went that route, it would probably be having to play two tight ends at once. And you would have the guy who's the receiver body, and then you would have an offensive lineman, you know, who could who could play some tight end, um, but but not nec- not be a pass catching tight end type deal. I mean, there, mm. you look at that roster and you're just like, I, I don't I don't see a big receiver that slides inside, right? I mean, Brew McCoy is not yeah. really a tight end. Okay, well, who else on that roster would be a big wide receiver that could slide inside? Mm. I mean, it's not Chaz Nimrod, it's not no. Caleb Webb, right? I mean, those it's none of those guys. I mean, there's not mm. a slot guy moving inside. You know, I mean, it's, you know who's big enough that like if you didn't have the need at running back, it's like Cam Selden. I could see slot like he's a big kid. Like so Cam Selden is like, right. yeah, he. I mean, you're right, but he's also your. your I, exactly, like it's not a it's not a choice you can make, but it is where I'm thinking like those kind of Princeton fan type frames. Like he's not as big, but he's kind of. You saw him moving through. Cam Selden was a lot bigger than I thought he was when mm-hmm. I saw him running through holes and. Yeah, no, he's, a big, he's a big guy. I mean, yeah. he, he he's a really big guy. Um. You know, there's not a defensive end. No. You know, that so they tried say, Chandavian, right? They tried. Uh, yeah, and, and, and yeah. you know they've got Emmanuel Okoye, who's yeah. just. I mean, he's there, but I mean, he is. It's not his fault. He's just so far away physically and mentally. I mean, mm-hmm. they, they got they got played they got played about six months in pads for in his entire life before he got a scholarship offer, mm-hmm. and 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 the high school or the club or whatever it was he played in over there. I mean, they practiced on the soccer field that didn't have hash marks or yeah. sidelines or end zones, you know, or it's just take time. Yeah. I mean, it's, I mean, and you don't know if he'll ever get there, but I mean, yeah. it, it's, it's hard for you to say, okay, he's been here, you know, nine months, 10 months. All right. He, he's good. He's ready to go. I mean, that, that's a true project, not his fault. Yeah. It's just, he's a true project. And that's okay. But I, um, yeah, I think it's got to be tight end. I were you surprised they didn't take two in the portal, or do you think it was just one of those they didn't have a choice? Because no, I think they would have taken two if the right mm-hmm. two would have come. I just think it was hard. You know, I think it was hard to convince somebody that can be our emergency tight end, right? Because <laughs> we don't have depth. Yeah, I mean, it's hard. It's hard to say we're really going to play three. They yeah. would. They would. But it's hard for it's hard for. I mean, if a kid's going in the transfer portal and he's a good player, why is he going in the portal? Yeah. One, he's probably lost his quarterback. Or B, they're not using the tight end in the passing game. And he wants to go somewhere where he's the guy, right? I mean, mm. Lance Hurd picked Tennessee because he didn't want to he didn't want to split time, right? He was ready. He was tired of standing and watching some all Americans play in front of him. So he comes to a place where he could step in and play. Mm. Well, I mean, Holden Staves picked Tennessee because he could step in and play. It, it's kind of like going and getting a, you know, everybody's like, why don't you go to the portal and get a quarterback? Well, who's coming? Yeah. Right. I mean, you go get two tight ends. Uh, you know, is Ethan Davis going to stay if you get a second tight end out of the portal? Yeah. 
you know, then you're sitting here a year from now and you have no tight ends on your roster, right? So yeah. I just think it was really hard to it really almost impossible to land two tight ends, two quality tight ends, and you say, hey, they're gonna plug and play, step in and help us right away. I agree. Um so I wrote this week, Brent, about something I saw because Chris Lowe, I don't know if you saw his piece on Florida for Tennessee on their schedule in 2024 of like that being the big it's good. Look, it's a big deal. You get Florida and Alabama at home back to back. There's no buy in between. Like I understand like on the surface why that would be the game you circle of like where Tennessee's heading if they're going to be a playoff team based on how those games go. I disagree. And I wrote about this and I'm, I'm curious if you share this sentiment. I actually think it's NC State on a neutral site in Charlotte is the game that will kind of tell us where Tennessee is going because they've lost, I believe, four games at home under Josh Heupel since he's been at Tennessee. Four total. And you get Bama and Florida, obviously, you swept them in 2022 at home. They've lost one in the last two years, and that was to a very good Georgia team um, this past year. One of the thing, there's a lot of reasons to trust Josh Heupel at Tennessee. One of the best is the home atmosphere and him protecting home field through three years here at Tennessee. It's a tough place to play and his offense. And I think his style makes it even tougher when you dig yourself a hole against this Tennessee type of team inside Neyland. I just don't, I don't worry about the Florida game. I think if you're a Tennessee fan, what you have circled is you can't take the NC state game uh, lightly because it's going to be Nico's first true I wouldn't say road test because it's in Charlotte, it's a neutral site, but I mean, still like two hours from Raleigh. Like, I think they'll, there'll be a healthy turnout for the Wolfpack. You've got Noah Rogers, big transfer from Ohio State coming in. You got Grayson McCall, all time passing completion percentage leader at NC State. Dave Doran, all he does is win eight or nine games every year. They're over under, I believe, is nine and a half along with Tennessee. They're going to be competing near the top of the ACC. Florida's not. Uh, Florida, uh, I just, I don't see the same with Florida. I don't see the same with Alabama coming in, uh, to Tennessee this year. I think Tennessee will be favored in both of those games. I look at the NC state game where look, we're going to be rocking. I'm sure UTC like no offense, but like, hopefully they moved it Thursday night. Cause Thursday night was, is a delight when we can focus on the other games for that one. I, I love the Thursday night opener for Tennessee. It's fantastic. I hope they do that this year. Um, but you're not going to look glean much from that game, right? You're going to gleam a lot from NC State, neutral site, a good football team that could win the ACC if things go right for them this year. I just, to me, think that's what will tell us where things are headed with the offense, how things are looking, who's going to be the new guys to pop. Because remember, who's like Pitt gave Tennessee fits there two times in the ACC. And they obviously come in here and win early in Heupel's tenure three years ago. And then Tennessee it had to go to overtime. It had to be a Cedric Tillman masterclass out wide for Tennessee to survive on the road um, against Pitt. So I just think to me, what we've seen in the past with Heupel and the ACC, what I think NC State could be this year, to me, I'd have the NC State game as the far more important uh, game to just check off and don't overlook and win because I think they're going to be okay against Florida and Alabama at home. And I, I don't know if every Tennessee fan... Uh, agrees with that. What do you think, Brent? Well, I, I think there's, I think there's two different, there are two different, te- you know, there, there are two different games there. And, mm. and what I mean by that is the first test is going to be NC state. Now, if yeah. you just said, if you'd asked me about NC state pre-transfer portal, I would have said, no, mm. you know, I'm not, they, they lost two dozen guys to the portal or 20 guys like, okay, they, they got issues here. You know, but they they've gone and, and got them some weapons, you know, yep. and, and had it had a really solid portal addition deal, uh, which is why there's there's some jolly too at tight end who Tennessee yeah. looked at and yeah yeah I mean there's there's a buzz about some of those guys mm-hmm. and and so um, I, I think that that's a that's a tough one because um, it's the first one on the road. Um, the, they may have, you know, if you don't move your opener, they're going to have a couple more days to prepare because they're opening on Thursday night. So they got mm-hmm. a couple of days to prepare for you that you don't get. You're right. You're not going to glean anything from the Chattanooga game, yeah. you know, um, uh, unless, you know, you got the quarterback who struggles or, or, you know, the offense is just really sputtering along. I mean, they're not going to lose that game, but just sputtering along here. And it's not, it's not overly impressive. You're going to go, oh, I don't know about that. But, mm-hmm. but the true test is going to come NC State, 
you know, now, now where I would agree with Chris a little bit is you, you get Florida and, and that's, you know, you got a hold serve at home. I think the Florida game, there's going to be a ton of pressure on you. Hmm. Um, it's Florida. It's the rival. Um, you've opened on the road at Oklahoma, you know, um, which is no easy task. So if you yeah. don't win at Oklahoma, then you have to win at home against Florida. That becomes much more of a must win. If you were to upset Oklahoma on the road, then everyone's going to assume you're going to handle Florida at home. Um, but to your point, with with new guys playing and with um, you know a new quarterback and and everything kind of what it, what it is, new running back and this that and the other. There, there, to me, there's there's more uncertainty going into that NC State game. Now, yeah. you know, as I don't know what coach said this, I've covered a few of them through the years. The more you win, the bigger the game gets moving mm-hmm. forward, right? I mean, you start stacking wins, and then the pressures the pressures there for how important. Or if you drop when you shouldn't, you know, with the twelve team playoff, you can still get there, but you better not drop another one, right? And so, yeah. um, you know, it just mounts as the season goes along, but. You're exactly right in the fact that that NC State game is no lay down. It's no gimme. And, and Tennessee better be ready to play that one. Um, you better not take anything for granted there. I, I don't I don't worry about them emotionally or mentally against Florida at home. Now, they got to go out yeah. and execute. But, but listen, they'll be ready to go. And I don't think that's a really good Florida team. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think there's more... There's going to be more uncertainty about the NC. Now, NC State's going to have some uncertainties, but that's going to be an intriguing game. Mm-hmm. That's going to as as that week gets here. There's going to be more people going. Oh, this game's a little more. Yeah. You know, there's more to this than this game because right now everybody's talking about, hey, Bama's gettable. You know, Napier's on his way out at Florida. Most people, you know, a lot of people think you know they're going to struggle there. Yeah, da 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 da. And there's an assumption that you know you're, you're going to be cruising to through your first two heading to Oklahoma. Yeah. And you, you, you better That's not dangerous. Yeah. You better not take anything for granted there, particularly with the weapons they brought in. Cause I, I think they'll, they'll, they'll be able to score. And typically Dave Dorn's teams have always played good defense. Mm. That's not been an issue. Yes. They've had issues scoring and staying. Tony Gibson's an elite defensive coordinator. Here. He's one of the best in the country. Yeah. They, they've been good on defense year mm. in and year out for sure. I, uh, I'm glad we're on the same page. And I look, if you get through Oklahoma unscathed and oh. NC state, I mean, you're looking at, 11 and one is probably where you're, you're headed with Georgia, the Georgia game being the one loss because this schedule is just nice. Like the more you look at it, the more you just say, you can see like why 10 and two feels very much in play. 11 and one feels very much in play. And I just, I, like, I wouldn't over, I wouldn't worry about the Florida, Alabama back to back. Like you would in years past, like we would, we would be scared years ago. Right? Like oh, what, true. uh, <laughs> this this kind of stinks. No, no, nothing in between to break up uh, Florida and Bama. But at this iteration, no Saban and everything else. Like, I think Tennessee should feel good about their and fans. The home games matter, and I just I love that George is the one on the road because you'd rather have that one on the road because it's already extremely hard to beat them. I don't want to burn a home game against a team like Georgia. We saw it last year. It's like no, that's the one you actually want on the road. Like I would beg to play George on the road every year because if you get a you surprise them, all right, cool. We we won on the road and we stole one in Athens. But um, as of right now, you want those kind of 50-50 games like A and M last year. You want that at home. I don't know how that goes in College Station mm-hmm. a year ago, but you get them at home. I think that was a big difference well, in that, Tennessee and getting that, that game win. Ended, that game ended Jimbo Fisher's career at A&M, mm-hmm. you know, and, and that was one that your home crowd was, yep. was a huge factor in, in winning that game. And Josh Heupel played field position and, mm-hmm. it, and obviously paid off in, in, you know, in his favor. I, I think the Florida thing, I think the Florida team is going to be intriguing. I've seen some people try to create a little buzz about Florida, some talk about, hey, they're not going to, you know, they're going to be this. They got a hot shot. You know, quarterback is going to give him a chance to be, you know, this or that. Look great. Have you seen the last eight games? You don't have a choice. Like, it's the worst eight game stretch I've ever seen in college football. Yeah. So, it's, I've never seen anything like it, Brent. Yeah. So, we'll, we'll see about that one, you know. And, and then I, I think the, I think the situation in Alabama is just really intriguing because yeah. you're going from such an identity mm-hmm. to, a bunch of stuff that's new and everything that's new is going to be scrutinized. 
Mm. It's just going to be scrutinized so bad and so hard, you know, that I, I, I'm going to be curious to see how that team plays, you know, because I don't know if this new coaching staff can will wins the way Nick Saban can do. I mean, you know, mm-hmm. you look, I, I look at, you know, that Alabama team, um, Milro got better. I, I, I get that he did, but there was some games that they won that they just, the last couple of years, they won because of Bryce young. They mm-hmm. won because uh, of a fluke play here and there. And they won because they just knew they were going to win. Yeah. Do, do they really believe they're going to line up and win every game like they have the last decade? They th- There's not a game they went into the, the last 10, 12 years under Nick Saban where they didn't go, we're winning this game. Do do they have that? Can they keep mm-hmm. that with a with a whole new regime down there? I don't know. Uh, I think I think that this is going to be a great case study for for replacing a legend, which we all know is pretty hard to do. It's not yeah. the easiest thing in the world. Um, speaking of head coaches here, what uh, now that you've covered Heupel for four going on four years, what's been the biggest change you've seen from Josh Heupel, the coach, from when you first met him and saw him as a coach to where he's at now with the program? I think he's got a better grasp of coaching the game where it's not just about it's always that it's always all gas, no breaks, score, mm-hmm. score, score. Now, I mean, the Alabama game, he went for it on fourth down a couple of times. He didn't need to, you know, but, but, but the A&M game, I'm not sure year one, Josh Heupel plays that game that way at home mm-hmm. and plays field position and punts the football. Um, you know, I, I think he's growing in game management in mm. terms of when you're going to go and when you're not going to go. Not just go for it on fourth down, but when you're going to be super aggressive here or you're not going to be super aggressive there. I, I think he's trying to play a little more, quote, complimentary football mm. uh, because this league's it's hard to line up. I mean, you're not playing in the AAC where the final scores are every week are 54-53. Now you're not playing. You're not playing ten seven games in this league either. Okay, this league is not there where it was, you know, a decade or so ago because of the growth of, of offenses. But but I think that that he's coaching games differently based on his opponent, based on where his defense is playing, based on what his offense is playing. Um, that that part of it I think is, is pretty pretty interesting to kind of watch him grow. Um, you know, and play some field position type football. It's just in game stuff that I think you've seen. You see him coach a little bit differently in that way. Um, I don't think personality wise, off the field or in the locker room with his kids. I don't. I don't think he's changed a great deal. I mean, everybody's had to adjust because of nil. No, you know, that not, that's not just Josh Heupel. That's every coach out there is having to do that. But uh, you know, it, the value, the understanding of recruiting. You know, and you know, that type of thing was always there, but I think he's got a probably a better appreciation for it after having gone through, you know, recruiting in this league because it's a different animal in this league than yeah. everywhere else. Uh, but I think for fans to see, I think the bigger thing is probably see him shifting a little bit um, in, in some game management situational stuff. Interesting. Um, how will I, it's early here, but based on like early returns and what you've gathered, uh, doing more intel and research on Inge and, and Sims here as the new running backs and linebackers coach here at Tennessee, how will they impact the Vols in the short term in different ways? And maybe in the long term, what are what are your expectations? And because I think they bring very different personalities and skill sets from what I've what I've gathered. What what do you think is going to be most intriguing in that in that capacity with those two? Well, I think with Sims, you know, there, there's going to be a little more juice, and that's not to say Jerry Mack was a passive guy, but Jerry mm. Jerry Mack was steady Eddie, right? Like, yeah. you know, Jerry Mack was one of those guys. Jerry, somebody still in your car? Well, we're going to have to get on that, aren't we? We're going to have to deal with something about that. Well, it's okay. We'll figure out a way to do. So. I mean, that mm. that Jerry Mack never panicked about anything. He never got worked up about anything. He was pretty even kill all the way through. I think there's going to be a little more emotion with Sims. Okay. Not, not that he's a panic guy, but I think there's, there, it's going to be a little more um, emotional, a little more intensity at times that way, uh, which, which will be a change for, for the running backs. But, but I think that's, you know, I don't think that's necessarily a 
bad thing. I, I, I do think it's going to be interesting to see where is who are the calming voices on the mm. offensive side of the ball. Um, Glenn Ellerby's a calm guy, but he's pretty introverted. You know, yeah. he's, he's pretty much an introvert. Um, Alec Ablin's in his second year. Kelsey Pope's young. Sims, he seems like an extrovert. You know, he is, but, but you know, he, he's not – He's not long in the tooth from an experience mm -hmm. standpoint. I mean, neither is Joey Halsley at running the entire side of the ball. Um, so they're young. I, I think, you know, the dynamic there will be interesting to see who's the guy that says, but take a deep breath here. Mm -hmm. okay. Don't, don't need to pound the glass. Let's not yeah. break a tablet. Let's not, let's don't, you know, crack a clipboard here. Let's everybody take a deep breath and, and let's go that way. So, I think that part is going to be pretty interesting. I, I think Sims is going to be a fine, a fine recruiter because I think his personality is going to lend to that. Um, when you talk about Inge, I think that was a hire that Tim Banks made because Tim Banks wanted a compliment to him to help marry everything together. Mm -hmm. Rodney Garner's a, a really good position coach. He's a thirty. He's a three-decade position coach in the SEC, who's never been a coordinator, who's never had a desire to be a coordinator. He's coaching technique. He's coaching fundamentals. He's coaching scheme of his defensive linemen. Mm -hmm. Banks is coaching secondary, and you've got to tie the front and the back together really well. And and I think that he wanted someone that could help him do that. That could be a you know, uh, a sounding board, eyes, ears, and a guy that was very complimentary to him that way. And, and I think, you know, Inge has been a um, co-defensive coordinator. He, he's had some success. He sounds and just talking to him like a guy who's probably not going to just go bananas and fly off the handle and go crazy. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I think Brian Jean-Marie was a guy like that, was like mm – -hmm. I mean, he, he would tear into his linebackers, but, but I mean, there was never, I think he was a, a pretty nice calming influence as well. And I think that's what they were looking for with, with coach Inge. I think it's going to be interesting to see technique wise. Does he change anything with how the linebackers are coached and, and some of the things they're looking for? You know, you talked about what he's looking for in a body type. Everybody's looking for long guys who can run, you know, side to side. Um, but how does he, you know, how does he fundamentally develop those guys compared to what they did with, with Brian Jean-Marie, who I think was a really good coach at Tennessee. Uh, but I think Inge has been, a, you know, veteran, been through the wares, you know, kind of been through it a little bit and, and can help, you know, Tim Banks that way. And, and I think that's why Tim Banks went that direction. That's who Tim Banks targeted right out of the gate. Hmm. That was his guy. That's where he wanted to go. That's what he was going to go after and, and, and convinced him to not go to Tuscaloosa and come to Knoxville instead. I like it. Uh, final thing here. This is a basketball question. Okay. If ten, let's see, makes the final four, why will it have happened this year in your estimation? Like, just when you think, like, I just tell you right now, hey, Tennessee's gonna make the final four. What do you think the story is to why Tennessee made the final four this year? Because they could score. Hmm. They could score. I mean, you go and look at the tournament games that they were they were ousted in, games that they lost. Um, you know, uh, there's not many games where they scored over 60 points. Um, no. I, I, and in their last five tournament games, um, the games that put them out, they scored 55, 68, 56, 94 in overtime to Purdue, which is the anomaly, and then 62 is the other. Mm. And, you know, I think it's the fact that this team can – has the ability to score 75 points. And, it, it, and you don't have to have – you don't necessarily have to have one guy go bananas for you to get to 75. Now Dalton connect can get you to 75 probably, mm -hmm. but you know, Jonas, adu has got to step up and be a factor. Um, and he's got to be a factor on offense, which goes back to my overall point that they can score that they, you know, Zakai Ziegler, you didn't have a year ago. He can go score for you. Those three have to carry this team. They need, they need eight to 12 from Josiah. You know, they need six from Ganey. Um, I know everybody's talking about Santi. They need, I mean, I, look, he is what he is at this point. I don't know that to, I, I think it's unrealistic to say, Hey, they, we need double digits out of him in the tournament for Tennessee to advance to advance. Tennessee's got to play defense mm. and they got to score and scoring is Dalton connect Jonas, they do and Zakai Ziegler. And over the course of the year, those guys have scored. Now you got to stay out of foul trouble. 
to stay on the floor in order to score. Um, all those things factor in, but but you look at this, it's it's Adu, Ziegler, and Connect that's going to have to carry this team if they're going to get, if they get to the final four, those three guys have had a great tournament run. Yeah, and I think more than anything, if you look at Santi's year, like he had some games where I think the Ole Miss game, he was like five for eight from three, something like that. I mean, I just think he's going to be streaky where I think you need, if Tennessee makes the final four, it's because Jonas and Santi had a game or two where they did go off, where it couldn't be all connect or Adu or Sakai and that they pushed them through for one of those matchups because it benefited them. And they were able to push this team through with their leadership, their veteran know-how that they get them there. I think they're going to need those two um, to push them through a game or two is, yeah, I is mean, my guess. Well, I mean, I, I think one of those two guys, I mean, I don't think they, if, if those, you know, if those guys no show, you know, the tournament, then, then Tennessee's not going to get there. Okay. Mm-hmm. But, but at the same time too, I, I think, I think Tennessee can get there without Josiah scoring 26, like he did. At right. Kentucky. Um, you know, that's what I'm saying. I mean, you know, you need him to do the things that he does, make a couple of threes here and there, you know, get you 10 points, you know, something like that is a, is a nice, is a nice game for him. If he, mm-hmm. if he has a game where he shoots and shoots it better and scores 15. Okay. That's great. I mean, no. I mean, he scored Alabama. What do you, I don't know what he finished with at Alabama, but he, but he made three really big plays. Yeah. He, made, he made a couple of really big threes, you know, Jemai Meshack made a couple of plays. I mean, you're going to have to have a game or two where somebody makes a play. They don't necessarily have to go off scoring. But mm-hmm. they're going to have to make a critical play at some point in the basketball game to, to win the game. And and you look at that Alabama win. What they do? They made plays in the last five minutes, right? I mean, yeah. you, you look at. It, I mean, they they made a bunch of plays in the Kentucky game to get back in it. They just couldn't make the one play to tie the game, right? Um, and so what you know about the tournament is the last five minutes of of the half is going to be you know, critical in the first half, and then the game's going to come down against good competition. It's going to come down to a possession-by-possession possession game in the last five minutes. Yeah. Are you going to be able to answer the bell? At Alabama, they answered the bell. Um, South Carolina, they answered the bell. Can, can you close out games in the last five minutes? Tennessee couldn't do that against Loyola Chicago, right? They, yeah. they, they couldn't do it in an overtime game against Purdue. But now they got it, they forced it to overtime, but you know, last year they did it against Duke down the stretch. They they did it against Lafayette the first game. They couldn't do anything. I mean, they had a lead. Everybody forgets they had a lead against Florida Atlantic. They just didn't yeah. score. They didn't do anything down the stretch. So what? Do you, who's going to be the bell cow in the last five minutes? And right now I feel like you feel pretty good about Ziegler and Dalton Connect being your bell cows at the last five minutes. Who can go get you a bucket? Because that's what the tournament comes down to. When it gets possession by possession, Who's going to go get you a bucket or who's going to go get a bucket for somebody else? And that's me. That's the guy, the guy Ziegler getting a bucket or getting somebody else a bucket or it's connect on an isolation or connect making a play out of a double team. Yeah, I love it. Hey, Brent, what can the good folks check out from you and the team over at VolQuest.com this week? Well, we talked about it. There's a lot of stuff going on right now. We talked about that off the top. We've got full coverage basketball. Um, following this team all the way through the tournament. We've got baseball coverage, spring practice. Um, all week long, we've run a primer leading up to the start of spring practice, and we'll have full coverage when Tennessee gets the practice field on Monday. So um, it's a fun time right now. There's a lots of stuff going on, lots of discussion, lots of anxious moments for fans as you get into, you know, the, the, the beauty of March is the chaos and bracket busters and all that. So you're in it as, as a fan, and your team is one of those teams who's, not supposed to be, you're not supposed to bust any brackets, mm-hmm. right? Your bracket's supposed to go chalk for your team to get there. It's a different place, right? And, and so um, there's a lot of uneasiness and, and yeah. restlessness uh, and nervousness. And, and and it starts for Tennessee in the SEC tournament and, and obviously takes center stage with the NCAA tournament. But we're going to travel and cover it all and be right there in the middle of it uh, with, with our entire staff. We'll be talking about it on the message board. So it's a great time to check us out right now. Absolutely. Go check them out today. Ballquest.com. Brent and the team do great work and uh, love listening and reading them each and every day. Brent Hubs, always a pleasure. And we'll have to do this again soon. Sounds good, man. We'll see you, buddy.